So, uh, good morning everybody, my name is Richard Glenn. Um, I run the collateral management sales team for Clearstream, uh, covering the UK, Ireland and the Americas. Um, within the world of uh, Clearstream and the, specifically uh, the Global Liquidity Hub, uh, we cover in broad terms every type of collateralised product as part of our post-trade infrastructure. So that would include repo, securities lending, as well as collateral management for both cleared and uncleared derivatives. And good morning everybody, my name's Carl Wyborn. I, uh, I'm Head of Sales for Cloud Margin. Uh, I joined Cloud Margin only relatively recently in October of last, uh, last year. Prior to that, I spent uh, a year or so at NetOTC, who you'll, you'll hear about shortly, and then, but prior to that, 20 years at JP Morgan, all in the, uh, all in the collateral management space. Um, just 30 seconds on Cloud Margin, it's, as, as Bill alluded to, it's a web-based collateral management tool. I don't think it's USP is that it's web-based, however, it's the, it's the things we've managed to do after having put it in the, in the cloud that, that uh, make the difference, but we'll spend a bit of time on that, I think, shortly. Sure. So the point of this session is <clears throat> for you to come away with an understanding of what the Cloud Margin guys have built, but also because the Clearstream fits into almost anybody's infrastructure, also what they're doing to try and take what they already have and repurpose it to some degree to make it useful in this new bilateral space. So we'll try and integrate the conversation. We'll see how it goes. I thought we'd kick off with Carl because I've got some questions that I think people might want to ask. You're welcome to explain your platform, but the one I wanted to kick off with was, given that it's web-based, if you're a customer wanting to use Cloud Margin, much like any service, you've got to get data into it to use it in the first place. So I thought to myself, if I sign up for Cloud Margin, what sort of data do I have to get into your platform to make it useful, and how does it get there? And as a starting point, I thought it'd be interesting to hear about that. Sure. And it probably makes sense just to kind of talk about who we feel are our kind of target client base first of, <laughs> first of all because um, the, the, the cloud margin concept, the philosophy was around creating a community for the what we would call very generically the buy side. Uh, for uh, for collateral for, for the collateral management platform itself, so we're not we're not uh, uh, focused uniquely on non cleared. We're not focused uniquely on cleared. We think of the world kind of somewhat holistically in 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 that sense, and we we think of our our target client base effectively as everybody who is not a tier one dealer. Uh, notwithstanding actually that we've had a good number of conversations with those in terms of how we might leverage the, the platform for a kind of for a mutual benefit and we can talk we can talk a little more about that <coughs> but, but our, our, our you know our, our client base today is 50 percent what you might call tier two banks irrespective of where you kind of want to draw that line and 50 percent asset managers insurance companies and and uh, and corporates so we're we're not dissimilar in terms of concept to what we what we need to to operate the platform from most other from most other collateral management um, platforms. I would argue. So we divide the world between cleared and non-cleared, irrespective of whether we're looking after your cleared or your non-cleared activity. Uh, we still need a a, a, a certain <coughs> amount of static data. We need your 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 clearing agreements or your collateral agreements, the rules by which collaterals are going to be exchanged, and we need uh, we need details on your users and permissions etc etc then we kind of when we're moved thinking about the, um, the, the the collateral management process itself we're a we're a swift member so we ask our clients to ask their custodians to send us swifts with their available inventory on it their end of day uh, holdings and things of that nature and by that method we we have um, collateral availability and thereafter, uh, we need a trade file or a portfolio of, of, of transactions that are going to be collateralized. So those, and that's where we get into more, a little more detail around kind of cleared and non-cleared, if you like. So on the, in the non-cleared space, our clients, some of our clients send us their own portfolios. The, the relationship we have with, <coughs> pardon me, with market means that if you're a market client, if you, uh, if market value your, your swaps or indeed your cleared trades, we have, uh, we're into integrated with market and they'll send us the, uh, the trade portfolio with the latest uh, PVs on it. In the non-cleared space, we've built out to uh, all of the major clearing brokers APIs. So for those, for the cleared activity, we take, in an automated way, we take broker statements from the, uh, from the, from the clearing brokers, irrespective of whether they're OTC or futures and options. So going, going live, and I guess that's kind of one of the 
benefits, if you like, that uh, don't make this an advertorial for sure. But but being in the in the cloud is simply that we've built all the downstream connectivity. We've built to trade repositories. We've built to market. Some of the guys from Open Gamma are in the room. We've built to Open Gamma. We just need a small amount of information to get that ball rolling and to manage the collateral on a daily basis. So that's Swift's <coughs> incoming files from uh, from clearing brokers and 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 trade portfolios. Um, you can be up and running in in a couple of weeks. And so, uh, you know, in, I guess in contrast to some of these more um, you know, sort of buying software and installing it locally or <coughs> whatever that might be, uh, where I think the on onboarding or implementation process is, is, is measured in months or indeed in certain instances even longer, we're looking to be kind of rapid fire, you know, from the point at which you sign a, a, a contract, we, we aim to have you live in two or three weeks and, and managing all of your collateral. Okay. So we'll come back to, I, I still have a question about trade data, but let's give Richard a chance. I'll be interested here. So Richard, what are you guys doing? I mean, Clearstream has its custody and tri-party offering. So what are you doing to align yourselves around these new regulations? Um, so I think maybe to follow on from what Carl was saying, also probably to make reference to, to, to the diagram behind, uh, behind us, um, Clearstream, I guess, is part of this, the, the financial system, is really infrastructure. So if anything, we're the bedrock on which a lot of the new processes which are being implemented are coming um, in, into play. We are the home of collateral for a number of banks and wholesale financial institutions. And therefore, naturally, the market is starting to m look at Clearstream as being part of the solution offering because of the fact that the regulations are placed in the centre because we are infrastructure, but because the banks have also built a lot of their um, systems and technology around the processes that, that, we, that we use. I guess what banks are looking to us now to do is to offer scale, for one, uh, in terms of collateral processing. They're looking for speed and efficiency by virtue of the fact that we offer collateral management in real time. Um, but I think th with the disruptive nature of the unclear world specifically, what they're also looking for is innovation. So whether it be flexibility around specific messaging or whether it even be around legal terms, for example. One of the things that we've talked about along with a number of our existing clients and also now with uh, the wider ISDA working community is how potentially we can reduce some of the paper chase for the implementation, not only for this September, but also beyond for the, for the, for, for the later phases. Uh, and in fact, what we've done is we've created a, a, a legal document, which essentially is a, a, a single page terms and conditions. What it means in reality is that irrespective of the number of counterparties with whom you have to interact, whether it be on the uncleared side, whether it be for cleared margin, whether it be for other financing products, you essentially sign up once and you can then add all of your counterparties in one go. Where we're talking about the uncleared space and I guess specifically now looking at the phase one entities in the room, we know that uh, time is of the essence and that the first September is a deadline which physically can't be moved. Therefore, from our perspective, what we're trying to do is to work with the community and identify where we can actually use that legal innovation to actually help streamline the onboarding process for clients, but more importantly then looking beyond uh, phase one to uh, phase two, uh, looking at more buy-side firms, looking at the tier two, tier three banks, is how can we actually then build uh, a stable legal and collateral management infrastructure which will make that next phase of onboarding um, a lot easier for everybody. So I think, if you don't already know, when the new regulations come in, your portfolio gets split in two. So they apply to anything going forward. So it's almost like the old world or the new world. The old world remains as is. Any new trades you book are covered by the regulations, which means that you've got to put in place new credit support documentation from September the 1st, and in your systems and procedures, differentiate between which trades fall in which bucket. So what Richard's alluding to is the idea that one option is that for all the counterparties affected in the first wave, second wave, you negotiate and sign up new documentation individually one by one. You could do that, and I think ISDA are coming up with a protocol or a sort of collective approach. It's not working yet. Yeah. So there is some activity at ISDA to try and make this work, which may not be working. Um, <laughs> all right. So what Richard's suggesting is that um, you sign a multilateral document with them Maybe you should explain yep. what the point of that is. So the, the whole point of the multilateral document is basically um, you reduce the number of documents which you have to exchange. Um, so for those guys that are looking at the 1st of September specifically, you're potentially talking about maybe a couple of hundred counterparties with whom you have to document your relationship. Within five months, unless you have unlimited legal resources and unlimited budget, that's realistically impossible. So given that we ultimately will be one of the chosen collateral locations to hold assets to cover the initial margin obligations, it sort of makes sense that you can also put that legal framework where the custody and the collateral is then held. 
and therefore by incorporating some relatively standard terms as part of our documentation, it just means not only going in September, but also looking beyond that, you can reduce the amount of paperwork that you need to do to get ready. More importantly, looking beyond September, there are a number of counterparties that aren't mandatory joiners for this year, but are actually looking to join early to make sure that they, they're part of the market and they don't feel marginalised. Therefore, from an onboarding perspective, we are expecting there to be a rush going towards September as more people outside of the phase one firms will look to join. And therefore, if we can reduce that onboarding timeline, that onboarding paperwork, then obviously it makes everyone's lives a little bit easier. And more importantly, it allows banks and their clients to do what they should be doing, namely a printing trade. Sure. Can we go back to the cloud margin or go to the, the first diagram? Go back again. That's it. So if we look at the cloud margin uh, row, You've got various partnerships there. Yeah. I'd be interested to hear about how that's working because you mentioned trade data. Mm -hmm. Now, in the conventional install integrate approach, I would feed my trade data to, to some piece of software using some file mm -hmm. format. What's the equivalent with you guys and how does that then work with the partnerships? Yeah. And so again, I think we, <clears throat> we would divide the world between cleared and non-cleared. So I guess just to kind of frame this a little more because I think the, so I was at JP Morgan in kind of the early 2000s and there kind of the problem statement as it was described by to us by the by the buy side and and again I would sort of you know sort of smaller banks was I've got a problem with my with collateralizing my OTC derivative transactions and um, that was in an era where kind of portfolio managers were pushing to use OTC derivatives or you know, traditional asset managers were trying to become more like hedge funds so they could charge two and twenty and hedge funds were trying to become more like traditional asset managers so they could attract pension fund money and we all know how that ended up um, but the, the 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 point being that at that point in time the the the, the problem statement if you like was localized around OTC derivatives kind of fast forward to that to to today and I think that problem statement has changed significantly and will continue to the change for the next two to three years. I feel that we kind of know the end game here. We know what the future state looks like. It looks like a far more integrated collateral management kind of world, whether it's be through the use of tri-party, which I think everybody sees is going to become far more ubiquitous than, than it was uh, previously, or that through the use of you know, cloud-based technologies, whatever it might be. It's going to become a, it's a, it's a more complex world. It's more fragmented and there, there needs to, people need to join the dots more. However, from, from our perspective, what we see and in the conversations we're having with those kind of buy side names, the problem statement isn't any longer, I've got a problem with my OTC derivative portfolio. Many of these, you know, went to see a very large pension fund manager um, only recently who said by 2020 or whenever kind of the last threshold, the 8 billion threshold for non-cleared, they would anticipate by then, given the reduction in the amount of non-cleared activity that they're forecasting, that they would have, you know, maybe one or two portfolios which would breach that threshold. And these are very large directional portfolios with, you know, a good number of non-cleared transactions. The, the problem same as far as we're concerned, uh, and I will get to your, it's not a shaggy, it's something like Ronnie Corbett sitting here. Um, 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 the, um, the, the problem state is now much, uh, is equally biased towards cleared activity. There's more than 30 clearing models in Europe alone in terms of account structures, direct, full seg, ISA, OSA, and all of these, these, these models. And so there's some significant choices around how collateral moves from the buy side either through or via their clearing broker to a CCP and what it looks like when it ends up at that CCP and what level of protection they have on excess and things of that nature. In tandem with that, the, the, the large FCMs, the clearing brokers, are putting pressure on their clients to not use just cash any longer because that doesn't suit them from a Basel III LCR perspective. We talk about exempt and immune. You might be exempted from a particular regulation, but you're by no means immune from it. An LCR, I think, is a classic example of that, where the buy side now is under a lot of pressure from the clearing brokers, not just to dump loads of cash on them, 
for the purposes of you know, reusing that with the, the CCP. The clearing brokers through commercial means, i.e. pay miserable returns on cash, are incentivizing the buy side to actually use securities for IM and, um, uh, and, and cash, but recalling cash buffers at the end of the day for, for, for VM. So we see the world now as kind of converging towards a point where cleared and non-cleared start to look like kind of in terms of the sort of problem statements attached to them, look very similar. There's not a kind of material difference, with the exception of uh, disputes, there's not a material difference between the operational overhead of managing cleared margin as there is non-cleared margin, which historically has never, has never been the case. So we see, so we see, um, um, there's limited got, time, just, all right. I've <laughs> just got going. Um, so, um, um, so we see, um, to answer your question, so how do we get, how do we get the, 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 the trade data? Um, we can take that from a number of sources. The whole point, we're in, the, we're in the cloud, we're a technology company, we've got more technologists than there are uh, other people, any other kind of resource in our office. Come to our office, it's beards and sandals. The, <laughs> Uh, um, and well, these, so these, um, these guys, we can build to any file format. We we take um, data from market now in in prescribed file formats, whether whichever, irrespective of which service you subscribe to market, whether it's market serve upstream or PV valuations. Um, but the uh, and, and that's that's kind of simple for us. But that doesn't look, to my mind that's easy. That's the easy bit. It's kind of what is the level of integration and sophistication that we need to get to to, to solve all these problems. Sorry, so I think Rich. something you mentioned was the buy side and the assets they're using to cover these obligations. I think it'd be worthwhile to hear from Richard's their view as to what you can use to cover both IM and VM, and where cash may play a part in this because it, it links to what you said. Yep. Yep. I mean, certainly if you go through the regs in detail, um, there is a lot more focus on non-cash collateral, um, primarily also for the benefit of the banks, as Carl's already alluded from uh, a balance sheet perspective and also, I guess, from a negative return. Cash isn't, well, whilst it's most, the most liquid investment per se, it doesn't necessarily generate the most uh, yield for you as a company. Um, I think the big question around securities is that, you know, securities are defined by a number of different attributes at ICE and QCIP uh, level and therefore fundamentally trying to manage eligibility of non-cash collateral is relatively cumbersome and certainly requires the use of technology, a variety of different uh, data sources in terms of static, which obviously plays to, I guess, our strengths from a tri-party perspective. I guess from talking to market participants now about not only September but also the wider collateral management world, whilst there is a greater focus on securities, we know that banks are also awash with cash. Um, but the big problem with cash from a regulatory perspective is that cash cannot be ring fenced. There are various trust structures you can put in place uh, legally which do work, but generally to the average man on the street and the average bank, they won't necessarily be able to get those facilities up and running in the shorter term. So the question from a collateral management perspective is what can counterparties do in terms of accessing collateral? How can they mobilise that as efficiently as possible? And more importantly, what's also in the interest of their firms as to the collateral they want to use? There seems to be a big play around equities, specifically for the uncleared world. Uh, primarily also driven by balance sheet constraints and counterparties looking to utilise the assets that they have on balance sheet as effectively as possible. But at the same time, we also need to make sure that all of those assets are in, in the right place. When it comes to cash specifically, there are a number of different innovations that are currently being looked at out there, whether it be um, using things like money market funds, whether it be uh, other specific ring fencing arrangements. We think more firms will transition towards non-cash in the shorter term, but the question is whether, from an optimization perspective, they can do that as efficiently as they would like to do. So we've got five minutes. <clears throat> I've got more things I can ask these two, but has anybody got questions about these two firms? So the general question, uh, I guess I'd start with Richard. The, um, could you comment on the, the impact of your service, and perhaps Carl as well, on the traditional clearing bank model, like you think of Citicorp, their clearing uh, operation, their uh, FCM activity, and how you would dovetail your service into, into their uh, business model. Yep. Um, I mean, I think from a clearing perspective, uh, most clearing members and most sort of wholesale banks would have used Clearstream historically for managing collateral and optimizing their balances. 
Um, and particularly when we look at not only you know, the clearinghouse that we have in, uh, within the group, Eurex Clearing, but also the other clearinghouses that are out there. I think most counterparties are starting to realise from both a, a house and a client perspective that you know, optimization of collateral is uh, essential. But at the same time, from a, I guess from a processing perspective, you want to make sure that the, um, the technology that's utilised and the procedures that are used are also efficient for both client and bank. Most people that will know Clearstream, I guess, as a wholesale firm, will know that we traditionally face off to the banks and less so to the buy side. I think, if anything, that will now change. Uh, and specifically, as a lot of the clearing houses look at whether you want to call them a quad party or a direct delivery type model, I think fundamentally it exposes the likes of ourselves to more buy side firms. And it also means that more buy side firms will start to interact with us either directly or potentially via a custodian or collateral agent type facility to actually then not only get visibility over their collateral, but even directly manipulate how they want their assets to be moved more efficiently. And that will be done with working with the likes of the, you know, the cloud margins from a vendor perspective, as well as with any of the other custodians that have this outsourcing operation and want to interact with us from a collateral management perspective. And I, all I would add is simply that from our perspective, having built to the APIs of, of all but a handful of the largest clearing brokers, we've got two-way um, connectivity instruction receipt of brokers. So, so to the point at which cleared margin is starting to look like non-cleared margin from an operational standpoint, then, then that's been our point of focus. Um, we have what I would argue a very significant kind of announcement due in the next few weeks around some work we've been doing with um, with the clearing houses themselves, where clearly not to disintermediate or disenfranchise the clearing brokers, but there is an opportunity to, to give the, the buy side direct access. But there are some technology challenges associated with that, and, and, and we've been very focused on that. Thank you. Thanks, David. Any other questions people would like to ask? Yeah, I've got a question, <coughs> maybe for the panel, but directed at Carl. Um, with the onset of IM, the differences between cleared and non-cleared, there's going to be an issue with um, dispute management, reconciling the different IM calculations. What, do you, what does cloud margin bring to the table in terms of helping clients to solve that problem? So that's a really good question. So clearly, as you appreciate, I'm sure for, for cleared IM, there is, um, there is little opportunity to dispute the, uh, the value. However, there's a huge focus on trying to forecast that value. And that's the work we've been doing alongside Open Gamma to do that future view, what if analysis, validating the margin calls on the day themselves as well. In the non-cleared space, our relationship with market enables us to generate risk sensitivities and calculate um, uh, initial margin values market today of a number of ISDA SIM installations uh, on their hosted platform. Uh, they're able to generate those risk sensitivities uh, as well. So there's a real, for the buy side, there's a really significant demand, I think, for that. Up until that point, I'd always assumed that the buy side would simply use the sell side's values because being bilateral there's kind of an element of validation in that uh, in itself. So from our perspective um, we see IM both cleared and non-cleared as just part of that collateral continuum um, and as I said being cloud-based and partnering with other hosted platforms we're able to 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 support that what is becoming well I guess we saw end to end but kind of collateral moving to the front office which I think is a slightly overused term but nonetheless we're seeing that expansion of the importance of collateral. Okay so we're more or less on time any last minute short question any last minute comments from you guys you got <coughs> not a Ronnie Corbett just a brief <laughs> I'm not good at brief as a rule so I'll hand that over to Richard. Good night from here. Um, yeah, I mean, I was just probably going to say as a, as a final point, um, the fact that the regulators have forced a hard deadline now in terms of collateral management, I think is making people generally rethink how they want to interact. Um, and I think the beauty of you know, the likes of not only what we do, but the cloud margins, the net OTCs in this room, is it, it gives people a chance to break down the different areas of the value chain and work out what's best for them as a firm, not only for an immediate tactical solution, but it gives them an opportunity to rethink the business. So, you know, we, I guess as a firm, we welcome the disruption because it's giving us new avenues to, um, to work, but also it also highlights that clients like choice and they like the flexibility, and therefore if you can combine the different solutions as part of a best of breed, then hopefully, as we get through the regulatory uh, crisis, we'll all come out of the world a better place. So just as a note, we have the room and the facilities 
for an unlimited amount of time, infinite. So afterwards, you've got a chance to talk to these guys individually and ask other questions. For instance, how do you settle on T plus one? Triparty. Triparty. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you to Richard and Carl, and thank you for you guys for listening. Thank you.